All right, so today I am going to be, uh, I'm calling this teaching Revisiting Romans 9, and we'll be spending most of our time there in Romans. And this is a section of scripture that has caused a lot of discussion. I'm going to be using the REV version of the Bible today, available for free at stfonline.org. And I recommend the commentary tied to these verses in the REV as a reference to go back to. I also want to provide as a reference an audio teaching by John Shaneheit from September 1st of 2011 on Romans 9. If you're interested in this resource and would like to listen to it, go to stfonline.org and from the menu, go to resources and then to audio teachings and then mp3s and then look for a search panel on the phone you'll need to go all the way to the bottom i think on a laptop or pc it'll be kind of off to the right and in the search field enter romans 9 and i believe this is the only one that comes up and it's an audio teaching lasting about an hour and a half but it covers this section really well my teaching is considerably um shorter and so it's going to be more of a summary and hopefully um, hopefully it'll expound on the key points and um, help clarify this, some of this scripture. So as we get started, I want you to consider something. Have you ever been with some friends where a memorable situation played out that was so notable that you summarized it down to a phrase? You could mention the triggering phrase to the friends or family that were um, familiar with the situation and the phrase would bring back, you know, rich details, but other people that aren't familiar with the whole situation might hear the phrase and not interpret it the same way because they don't have the same context. And when they see reactions from you or your friends that don't match how they might understand the phrase, they might get curious and ask you about it. I believe God invites us into his context in a similar way. For example, he'll reference just a piece of, of the Old Testament in the New Testament from time to time. If all we read is the part of the Old Testament scripture being referenced, it might not seem very clear. But if we can get to understand more of the context, it can make a lot more sense. One place where this concept really comes to light is in Romans 9. And so I'm going to jump ahead and start this teaching in Romans um, 9 verse 10, and we'll read verses 10 through 13 right away, but I am going to cover other parts. As a matter of fact, I'll read the whole chapter of Romans 9 at the end, but um, I think the more challenging parts are here, so I'm going to cover them in detail first. So in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 10, it reads, and not only her, and the her here is uh, Sarah, um, Abraham's wife, but Rebecca also, who was married to Isaac, you know, Sarah and Abraham, uh, one of their sons, the second son, the son of promise. So, and not only her, but Rebecca also, when she conceived by one man, our father Isaac, for though they were not yet born and had not made a practice of doing anything good or worthless, in order that God's purpose in accordance with his choice would continue, not from works, but from him who calls, it was said to her, the older, older will serve the younger, this happened just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Now reading it just like that, it can come across a bit harsh, but let's take a closer look. By the way, I am not going to handle this section sequentially, uh, but I'll definitely tie it all together at the end. So right away, I'm starting at verse 12. Uh, where was it said, the older will serve the younger? It is the last phrase in Genesis 25, 23. But what was going on there? At a high level, if you can remember Abraham, he had a son with Sarah when they were older and the child was Isaac. Isaac got married to a woman named Rebecca. When Rebecca got pregnant, she was pregnant with twins. The two babies were moving around in her belly so actively that it was disturbing. And she asked God what was going on. His response is captured in Genesis 25:23, And Yahweh said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from your belly will be divided. One people will be stronger than the other people and the elder will serve the younger. Now, this is critical to note. 
God didn't say two infants are in your womb or two babies are in your belly. He said two peoples, two nations. Yes, she was dealing with a reality, but there were, are so many cases in the Old Testament and even the New where there's a much deeper reality going on than the physical world around us. In a way, she could have received comfort from the fact that the babies were referred to as nations. It suggests that not only would both be born healthy, but that they would multiply. Their wrestling around was just a symbol of the prophecy God was giving. There would be two nations. And Esau was born first, so he was the older. And Esau did become a great nation, but in his lifetime, he never served his brother Jacob. As a matter of fact, Jacob had pulled some trickery at one point that put him at risk of having his brother be angry with him. Jacob had actually left, you know, for some period of time to escape that anger. And that when he came back, he was feeling, you know, very concerned about what Esau's reaction would be. So Jacob offered Esau gifts in hopes of getting forgiveness. Esau's response was that he had more than enough on his own and Jacob could keep what he had. Esau's descendants were the nation of Edom. So Esau and Edom, when you hear those two, Edom is like the descendants of Esau. Jacob's um, descendants were the nation of Israel. So whenever you hear Israel, think about you know, Jacob. So we're looking at these two brothers here. The nation of Edom did eventually serve the, na the nation of Edom, but that was way in the future when the men, Jacob and Esau, had long passed. The, the physical reality in the pregnancy was just a picture of the future re reality of a prophecy. And what about the part in Romans 9, verse 11, where it says, For though they were not yet born, it had not made a practice of doing anything good or worthless. If either child, after had, having been born, stepped on an ant, brought a weed to their mom as a flower, and God made his choice then, could it not be construed as if the choice were made due to works? God was progressing his plan and the absence of any behavioral information makes it pretty clear. This has nothing to do with works. God had stated his promise to Abraham that with Sarah, they would have many descendants. Isaac was the only son of Sarah, but Isaac was having twins with Rebekah. One would be part of the Christ line, the other would not. Put two things in front of you right now, any two things. Now pick one. Sometimes <laughs> choices are, um, sometimes there may not be much of a difference at all. Here in Romans 9 11, God is showing that his choice of one had happened before either had done anything to influence his decision. There were two, God picked one. That's the point. Then I want to look at Romans 9 verse 13. It says, this happened just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Note that this too is a quote. Guess from where? Nope, not in Genesis. It's from the whole other end of the Old Testament, the very last book of the Old Testament. It isn't just the New Testament that points back to older books of the Bible. Here we have an Old Testament book pointing to another Old Testament book. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. And in Malachi chapter one, we read starting in verse one, if you wanna go there. Malachi chapter one, starting in verse one. The burden of the word of Yahweh to Israel by Malachi. And there's a lot of places where it talks about the burden of the word of Yahweh, just because when he gives words to his prophets, they're obligated to speak exactly whatever it is he tells them to speak, but it's not always good news. And in this case, um, yeah, he has some things to say to Israel that aren't good news. But anyway, so Malachi is speaking, the burden of the word of Yahweh to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says Yahweh, yet you say, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother, says Yahweh, yet I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau and made his mountains a desolation and gave his heritage to the jackals of the wilderness. First, it's really important to realize it's not always about me. I mean, of course it is, but at the time it's written, the message needs to go to the people that are there. 
how would they have understood these words? Not to get too far off track, but I think this is important. Consider Proverbs 25. In 20, Proverbs 25, 11, it says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken at the proper moment. God's words are spoken at the right time and that it's really significant. In Proverbs 25, going on to verse 12, it says, like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is a wise person reproving a listening ear. That when people are listening to God's word, his words are like gold. That it, if, if we're hungry to know God's word and we're really listening, it's really significant. God said the right thing at the right time to the right set of ears when he wrote his word, always. It can be so valuable to us if we can shift from our modern thinking and look at things through the audience of who God was communicating with at the time. So searching Google for how many words exist in ancient Hebrew, I just did that search yesterday just to see you know, what the comparison is. Um, it's a little tricky to get the results, but the numbers I got were between 7,000 and 8,679. That's how many words that there are in ancient Hebrew. I think some of the range difference had to do with technical aspects of interpreting something as its own word, uh, as opposed to a variant of another word. Searching Google again, for how many words exist in modern English? Again, the results were a little tricky, but the numbers ranged between 171,476, all the way up to about a million, if you included scientific words. So either way, the variation between ancient Hebrew and modern English is significant. We're looking at roughly less than, th less than 9,000 to over 171,000. That's a huge variation. The point is, what did hate? mean to them and that there's a whole range of of our modern english words that would fall in the category of the word hate that was used in ancient hebrew and that in this contents that context the answer is more like our word preferred i preferred jacob to isa i chose one over the other i needed to pick one there were two i picked that one no real reason not that big of a deal so the result, though, did end up having a lot of significance. The result was that once the choice was made, one, in this case Jacob, would be the next step in the Christ line. It would go out from him. The law, which also meant you know, the range of understanding could be instruction, would go to them. And that's a big deal. If there's no rules, I can just walk up to you and take your toy. No rules, no problem. Once there is a rule or instruction that says, do not steal, then I am obviously wrong if I do that and there is a problem. Other nations did not have that, this, did not have this at the time. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, his line got that. They were on the leading edge of getting to live in a peaceful, civilized society. Consider the difference that makes. And if you don't think it's a big deal, I'm coming to take your toy right now. <laughs> In Malachi 1.3, it points out that I hated Esau and made his mountain a desolation and gave his heritage to the jackals of the wilderness. This sounds harsh, but this is just a statement of fact. In Obadiah, which is another book of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, Esau, well, Edom, so the nation of Edom, but the same line is explained above, came to attack Israel. And it was one of those battles where the attackers went after each other and killed each other. So they started out wanting to attack Israel, but along the way, they got mad at each other, started fighting each other and killed each other. Israel came out to the battle to find all that was left for them to do was to pick up the spoils. I'm guessing if Eden, Edom hadn't gone out to attack Israel in the first place, things might've looked different. God is really just pointing out the results. And while we are digging into Romans 9, this isn't the only puzzling section. Let's look at Romans 9, uh, and we'll go to verses 15 through 18. 
So back, back in our chapter of Romans, and uh, verse, yeah, Romans chapter 9, verse 15, we'll start. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the one who desires to the one desires or the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I will raise you up for this very thing that in connection with you, I could show my power and so that my name would be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wants and he hardens whom he wants. Again, let's look at the same principle. Starting in verse 15, where was it written? This was in Exodus, Exodus 33, 19. So um, the quote in verse 15 of Romans, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That is from Exodus 33, 19. The context was that Moses was with Yahweh in the tent of meeting. Moses was talking to God about how he needed God to do his part if Moses would be successful carrying out what he was supposed to do. Yahweh said several things to assure him. It did not depend on Moses, who desired by this point to be successful with what God asked him to do. It depended on God, on Yahweh, who has mercy. Then how about verse 17, where it says, I raised you up for this very thing that in connection with you, I could show my power and so that my name would be proclaimed in all the earth. This is from Exodus chapter nine, verse 16. And it is after the sixth plague and before the seventh plague when they were still in Egypt. And God is telling Moses what to say to Pharaoh. God gave Pharaoh many opportunities to obey him. God could have taken Pharaoh down right away, but he didn't. God had mercy on Pharaoh. The plagues would not have continued and increased in, sever in sever severity had Pharaoh obeyed God after had Pharaoh obeyed God. <clears throat> after the tenth plague, the killing of the firstborn, Pharaoh got the message to the point that not only he not only tells Moses to take the children of Israel and go. If you look at Exodus 12. And verses 30 and 32, Pharaoh asks Moses for a blessing. By then, he actually believes that it's significant to go to God for things. That's the impact it had on Pharaoh. It would have been great if he stuck with that. But um, he kind of changed his mind later on, and that caused his demise. But at the same time, there was a time when Pharaoh actually believed God. It showed the character of God, both his power and his mercy, to the extent even some of the Egyptians. So that's based on Exodus 12, 38. And, you know, you can look through that and look through commentaries. You know, that might be disputable by some folks. But the way I see it, it talks about multitudes. And it suggests that some of the Egyptians went with the children of Israel when they left Egypt. That that's the impression that God was able to make through all of this. Both Moses and Pharaoh were approached by God to do something. Both, yes, even Moses, they were, both of them were reluctant to obey. And if you read the section in Exodus chapters three and four, where God first comes to Moses in Midian and starts telling him that he wants him to go to Egypt to take the children of Israel out of there, out of slavery, that, you know, Moses kind of, box at it at first that he doesn't want to do it and God works with Moses until Moses you know changed and he obeyed God but Pharaoh didn't God gave Pharaoh many choices also and that Pharaoh fought it and fought it and fought it and God kept you know giving more and more plagues trying to convince Pharaoh till Pharaoh changed momentarily but that he then he quickly went back to you know his own uh, his original stance of fighting against God and went chasing after the children of Israel. And that's when Pharaoh died. But the results for these two men were very different, but it's the same God. God was working with both of them, trying to get them, you know, to listen to him, to hear him, to do what it is he needed them to do. And that the obedience is the thing that made the real difference. So taking all this into account, let's start reading chapters uh, Romans chapter 9 from the beginning 
and see how this whole context plays out. So Paul, the apostle, is speaking here in Romans chapter nine. And I think this is one area where the, the chapter breaks were pretty clean. I looked at Romans chapter eight and that this is really kind of a fresh thought going on here. So I'm picking it right up in Romans nine, verse one. So it's Paul speaking and he says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience is testifying with me in connection with the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing pain in my heart. Indeed, I could wish that I myself were cursed, separated from Christ, in place of my own brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Have you ever done this? Where there's someone you care about so much that like they're sick and you're like, oh, I wish I could be sick instead of you. You know, like it's so hard for me to see you suffering. I, that's what I kind of see going on here, that obviously, you know, that doesn't happen, but that Paul cares that much about the, the you know, the Israelites, the Jews. Um, so picking it up in verse four, my, uh, well, the end of three, my kinsmen according to the flesh, in verse four, who are the Israelites? Theirs is the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the receiving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Theirs are the fathers, and from them, according to the flesh, is the Christ, God who is over all, be blessed forever, amen. So Paul really, you know, sees how significant, you know, God, the relationship was between God and Israel, that there was so much going on there, that it was huge. And for him, he felt like so connected to those people. Paul was raised up Jewish and worked to know of God in that context. He was a Pharisee. He had studied, you know, so hard to understand God and his word in the Old Testament that he saw how significant it was this choice to be with Israel. But now he understands the greater reality. And there are many places in the epistles where he appeals to the Jews to see Jesus as the promised Messiah. He aches for the Jewish people to understand. Continuing in verse six, it says, but it is not as if the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither because they are Abraham's seed are they all children, but through Isaac, your, your seed will be called. And so he starts to pull out this richness from the Old Testament to show that, you know, a lot of people cling to their descendants, you know, coming from the line of Abraham to come through Isaac. But Abraham had a lot of other children. It wasn't just Isaac. He had Ishmael first. Then he had Isaac with Sarah. But Isaac was the child of promise. That was the one that you know, he was going to choose to, you know, bring to pass the promises made to Abraham. But after Sarah died, Abraham married Keturah and had even some more children. So, um, so the point is, is that it isn't really this lineage so much that it has to do with relationship. And that this is what Paul is trying to build into here. There's a picture here. Um, and yes, there were children of Israel that certainly didn't follow God's word to Israel. So it's, it's more about the relationship, people being obedient and, you know, really looking to what God is telling them. Let's continue on in verse eight. So that is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God. On the contrary, the children of the promise are considered as the seed. For this is the word, the promise, about this time time next year I will come and Sarah will have a son. So, um, so here he's, he's really trying to draw out that it's about the promise and about the relationship, the promise of a Messiah, the relationship of people being obedient to God. And then we get to verse 10, and not only her, but Rebecca also, when she conceived by one man, our father Isaac, for though they were not yet born and had not made a practice of doing anything good or worthless, in order that God's promise in accord with his choice would continue, not from works, but from him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. This happened just as it is written. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So what are we to say? 
there is no unrighteousness with God, is there? Absolutely not. For he, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the one who desires or the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very thing, that in connection with you, I could show my power and so that my name would be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he who has mercy, he, so then he has mercy on whom he wants and he hardens who he wants. And I just want to jump in here and mention this thing about he hardens whom he wants. There are some Hebrew idioms that come into play here. And if you go into the commentary, you'll see how that technical aspect of understanding the Bible turn, you know, plays out that there are these idioms sprinkled throughout the Old Testament and they carry additional meaning, kind of like, you know, um, stopping on a dime, you know, means a coin, the smallest coin we have that you can stop that quickly, that there's idioms like that in the Hebrew and that, you know, hardening someone is kind of like the anger thing with us. I may talk a little bit more about that, but anyway, um, God says some things that people don't choose to obey. God has shown mercy to all of us, but the things he does drives people to choose to be hard-hearted. Have you heard it said, people can't make you angry, you make yourself angry? And yet the phrase, you make me angry, shows up frequently enough in life. I think most of us are familiar with it. That's kind of the idiom that's going on here, that um, God wasn't really hardening Pharaoh, but he was saying things that Harold, that Pharaoh fought against and that the more he fought against it, the harder he got. And so that's what's really going on in verse 18. Um, let's go to, on to verse 19. So, well, then you say to me, why does he still find fault? For who has ever withstood his purposes? But who are you, O oh human, to argue with God? Well, what does molded say to the one who molded it? Why did you make me like this? Or does the potter not have the right over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel into a vessel of honor and another into dishonor? People have been disobedient to God at times. We all sin. Yet God is merciful. He provided a savior to pay for our sins. And until the day Jesus returns or we die, God gives the chance to accept Jesus as the payment for our sins. And that's a huge deal. God may work with people many times in many ways to help them see that. Again and again, God called everyone to salvation. He wants everyone to get born again and come to a knowledge of the truth. God keeps working with different people in different ways over and over again to help them see that. And until the day that they die, they have a choice to be obedient to God and that he's always there, just like he was with Pharaoh, just like he was with Moses. He gives them chance upon chance upon chance and hopes that they're going to do the right thing so that he can bless them with hello, eternal life, life in the age to come, and that if they really fight against him, that can mean death. That's what's going on here, that, you know, that with the lump of clay, a potter may take a lump of clay and throw it on the wheel, and he's hoping to make an elaborate vase, but the clay just doesn't cooperate, and so he's like, okay, fine, ashtray number 782, you know, that in the end, you make what you can out of it. God would love to have us all be these beautiful pictures, but if we don't cooperate, we may end up being another ashtray, that these are choices that we get to make. So let's move to verse 22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath, fitting themselves for destruction? And what if he did this in order to make known the riches of his glory, lavished upon the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, including us, whom he called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? As indeed he says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and she who is not beloved, beloved. And it will be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there will they be called sons of the living God. Um, in Hosea, it's, it's like God told Hosea to marry this, you know, prostitute and, 
and that there's there's some very interesting things that go on in that book and i'd encourage you to read it but again you know the point of this teaching is that if you really want to understand the richness of what's going on in the new testament then you go back to the old testament record and see the detail of what's going on there and then that pulls forward the richness and i i believe that a big part of this thing going on in hosea is to try and help people see that it's not always the ones that you would expect that are the ones that are going to find themselves joyful in the age to come that it's going to be people who's really had that relationship with god that might not have looked like they were such a big deal in this life that god looks on the heart he doesn't necessarily look on the outward credentials that people might see he looks at the heart inside people and that that's where the reward is going to come and he brought in a lot of gentiles that the jews never would have expected the gentiles to be part of it and he foreshadowed that a little bit in the book of hosea um, going ahead to uh, verse 27 now, but Isaiah cries out on behalf of Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel is as the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. The Lord will fulfill his word upon the earth completely and quickly. And just as Isaiah has foretold, if the Lord of if the Lord of armies had not left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have been like Gomorrah. So, you know, here he's talking about that without Jesus, without a savior, you know, this is foreshadowing it. Again, you look back to the Old Testament where it's written, but it's foreshadowing that, that it was the seed, it's Jesus that is the difference between becoming desolate, having no life in the age to come and having a full rich life to get to live on a healed planet and have a future. Uh, going to verse 30, what are we, to say what then are we to say that gentiles who did not diligently pursue righteousness attained righteousness even the righteousness that is by trust but israel pursuing the law of righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law why because they did not pursue it by trust but as if they could obtain it by works they stumbled at the stone of stumbling just as it is written See, I am placing in Zion a stone that will cause people to stumble, even a rock that will cause people to fail. But the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. So Paul uses these Old Testament references to help his audience, who has a Jewish background, that it has always been trust that gets us saved. Take a look at, the Bible, at a Bible complete with both Old and New Testament. Find where the separation between the Old and the New is. Look how many pages there are in the Old Testament. It really matters. So much of it is about God's people. That, this is, that is a significant distinction. It is very relevant picture of who we are today. There it looked a lot like bloodlines, but if you really look in detail, you find it was more about believing God. In the New Testament, it's much clearer. Trusting God is critical. Believing the Savior he gave us, Jesus Christ, is everything. It's the difference between being like a fall leaf, falling off a tree in a windstorm, that being this, um, comparing that to the strong tree that the leaf came from. The tree is going nowhere. The leaf, who knows where it ends up. When you realize who God is, what he can do, and the relevance of believing Jesus Christ is the promised son of God, who God raised from the dead, it's a game changer. Yes, we have problems. No doubt we will. Some are super significant, like, I don't know, death. However, looking at from God's perspective, even that's a temporary problem. You're hungry, you get food in your stomach, problem solved. You suffer and die. God raises you from the dead in a brand new body like Christ's glorious body to live on a healed planet, problem solved. Comparing the time span of this current life to life and age to come, which God is well aware of, our current problems are temporary. Yes, it's bad when it's happening. I mean, I see it too. Whatever's right in front of me, that's what I focus on and the pain in this life is horrible for so many people so many times problems 
with relationships, problems with health, problems with you know, trying to figure out how to survive between day, today and tomorrow. That's what we see. And it's really huge to us. But that in the long scheme of things, if our hearts are right, if we're really reaching out to God, if we're trusting God, if we build our relationship with God, if we look to Jesus Christ as that Savior, God is faithful and he will deliver. And we will have this great life in the age to come. And we'll look back on this time that we're spending in this earth and realize that it's small and that it's really the promises of God that are significant. It's bad when it's happening, but we're like those mature trees rooted in the reality of Christ. Trust God and believe in Jesus Christ. So in summary, whenever we see a scripture that references a different part of scripture, it's worth considering that that reference was placed there with God's precision. It's like a piece of a treasure map, and God is inviting us to go dig for the details to find the richness of what he is wanting to share with us. God could have made the Bible very easy, and in some ways he did. The most important part of scripture is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and God raised him from the dead. And it doesn't take a lot of work or digging to understand that. He made that super easy. However, to understand the fullness of that, takes a little more reading and work to understand. The more we dig, the more we find. God's word is an amazing treasure, and he leaves clues for us to dig and find riches that he has left for us. And that is what I want to share with everyone today. So thank you for um, being here and hearing my teaching. <laughs>